call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order and ask you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We usually open up the meeting with hearing of visitors and uh, for tonight's meeting, no one signed up to uh, address the school committee tonight. So we'll go right past that on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is a manner in which the school committee handles routine business uh, as a block and a group uh, to expedite the meeting. However, uh, any member of the school committee may request that any individual item be removed from the consent agenda for individual discussion and consideration. So at this time, I'll ask uh, if any members would like to remove an item from the consent agenda. Ms. Clark Wilson. I'd like to remove item C. C, okay. Any others? Okay, seeing and hearing no others, I'll ask for a motion on the consent agenda minus item C. <coughs> Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, item C, Ms. Clark Wilson. Item C is the approval of the Colleen Cahill Memorial Scholarship. I just want to thank uh, Colleen Kale's family for their generous donation. Uh, her parents are actually here in the audience tonight, uh, and I would like to invite them to come up and say a little bit about Colleen and the scholarship. The school department always welcomes these donations, and we're, you know, very um, thankful for their the family's donation and yeah. you know in their time. So if uh, Colleen's sure, parents absolutely. could come up. Sure, please, absolutely. Please come down and join us. Good evening. Thank Good you, school committee. Um, my name is Linda Cahill, and this is my husband, Richard. Richard Cahill. And we wanted to set up a scholarship fund for a high school student in memory of our daughter, Colleen. Um, specifically for a student that is entering the engineering field or a student that's an ROTC um, um, A cadet. member of the ROTC. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we're going to do some fundraising and um, hopefully we'll continue it on year after year. So that's about it. Any questions? We appreciate very much uh, what you're doing and this is a wonderful way to remember your daughter. All right. Thank you. I want to thank you on behalf of all the children that will come and will receive this scholarship in uh, Colleen's memory. And again, thank you to your family for this, this wonderful donation. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, no, I was, I was giving them a chance to go sit down. Yeah. So I'll, I'll entertain a motion. Cahill Memorial Scholarship. Yeah. Made and seconded. All in favor? It is approved. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the Cahill family. Back to the agenda. We will uh, then uh, now go to the report of the superintendent of schools. Thank you. It's always nice to start off a school committee meeting and con to continue to thank the businesses that support our schools. And, you know, again, the, this budget has been difficult and every bit of support helps. I think the school committee knows that we're looking to develop those relationships in the community. Uh, and one that was very natural this past summer uh, was uh, a Lowe's donation. And I'd like to, uh, first of all, invite uh, our principal, Kelly Silva, uh, Sean Desmond from our high school. Would you please come down and talk to us a little bit uh, about the support of Lowe's and especially uh, Laurie Tantillo who is representing Lowe's this evening. Um, so this summer, um, East had the honor of receiving a donation from Lowe's. The grounds look phenomenal. Um, I've had parents call and say, 
you know, I can't believe how great the grounds look. So, but in addition to that, um, Laurie was walking around our school and we have three substantially separate special ed classrooms and they had appliances that were pretty outdated. And without me asking, and this was not part of the plan, she said, well, why don't we donate some new appliances for the kids? And I mean stoves, washers, refrigerators. So it wasn't just that she donated to the school, she donated to, to my kids. So I want to thank her um, for that too. Um, and I'll speak a little bit. Um, it was mainly part of the Summer and Work and Learning program. And uh, Lori, I connected with her to uh, really to get some donations. And <laughs> she was nice enough to. It worked out well. Yes, it did very well. <laughs> very well. So, um, in addition to the, what they did at East, um, she gave many items to the high school. Um, if you look at the garden outside, there's a big composting unit. Um, it's like the centerpiece. And um, she donated all the supplies for that. Um, and supplies over in the greenhouse area. Uh, and also, um, helped out with some supplies for the Frederick Douglass Garden, uh, which some of the kids did some work over the summer. And Lori was fantastic, um, and it, it was amazing. So I want to thank you very, very much. They're very appreciative. So um, I didn't expect such a formal setting, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm a little more off the cuff, just kind of how I am. But um, it was just an awesome opportunity for Lowe's and, and for myself as well. You know, Sean had first approached me about the summer program that they have here at the high school. Um, you know, and just asked me, you know, for some gloves and some things like that. And I said, well, let me go over and meet with you. Let me see. I've, I've been kind of wanting to make that connection with Brockton High. Just haven't had the time to get over there. Let me go over and talk to you. So I said, hey, you know, I also do like workshop trainings and things like that. What do you guys get going? And he said, oh, that'd be great. We've got that going the first part of the first week of the program. I said, awesome. Get me into that. Let's see what's going on with that. Got to meet with some of the kids, found out about the program that they had going on, you know, at silver school you know cleaning up and stuff I'm like awesome we're in on that and walking around what can we do just so happened that I was also working at the Abington store as well as the Brockton store a lot of the, the employees in Abington are certainly have some Brockton ties so when I told them you know we have a budget every year it's called the Lowe's Heroes program that we get to help in the community so I was able to take the budgets from both stores and really kind of put those into the two different schools which was so cool because we're able to do so much for the kids over there i knew those appliances i thought you know we can put plants but what do plants do it makes it look a little nice these appliances that's going to go a long way for years with these kids to really make a difference so that was so cool and then to be able to help out the high school so much and just see all that was going on with that and um, it was just really, really a great opportunity. I'm very, very fortunate to work for a company that glows that we get to do that, that I have the opportunity to get out into the community. And then on top of that, I can't speak enough for the summer program that goes on over here at the high school. I was so impressed with Sean and his team, Mike Owens, the staff. I know teachers have the summer off, and I know a lot of them, you know, they're working, looking for a little income. I get that. When I spent Quite a couple of Fridays <laughs> yes, with you guys. <laughs> we were kind of like a of regular time. thing going on. Yes. <laughs> um, a lot of communication, a lot of time. This is truly a staff that cares about the kids, that cares about what's going on. And, and that was so cool and so refreshing to see and just really, really nice. And then on top of that, to see these kids have the opportunity to get out things that we take for granted. I know how to use a shovel, not because I work at Lowe's, but just because I'm home and I'm doing things around the yard and things. And you know, these kids, when I bring out the pruners and stuff, they're like, oh, what's that? What do I do with that? Show me how to use that. And learning how to shovel and, and little things that, that we don't always teach on MCAS and things like that. Just getting these kids the opportunity to do some, some real life, hands-on stuff that they probably don't get the opportunity to do at home with their families, that kind of thing, but to just get out and do. And, and it was really fun. And to see the pride that they really took with them with all of these projects was just awesome. And it was just truly, truly a pleasure for me to be involved in, in all the programs and all the things that we got to do this summer. So I look forward to doing it again. So it was great. Well, again, Laurie, we can't thank you enough because it, all, it is all about those partnerships. And again, to have the business community come into the schools, I appreciate you commenting on the hard work that our teachers do, no matter what time of year it is, because that is exactly what goes on. So as we start to develop these relationships with businesses, one of our hopes is to have and bring back what is called principal for a day. So we, can we count on you to come to one of these schools and, <laughs> really? and truly, get to, <laughs> truly get get to spend tips. the day uh, <laughs> being a principal of the school. Oh, that'd be and really And Ms. Silva fun. can just sit back and... <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the, the neat thing is my husband actually is, is grew up in Brockton, so he's from Brockton, and he went to East, it used to be East Junior High School That's at right. the time, so I'm going to tell him that I'm going to be the principal of his old school <laughs> when we go home. So that would be pretty fun. That would be great. We'd like to award you a certificate. Oh, very nice. Oh, Again, yeah. all these formalities going on here. I'll let you take care of it. I don't oh, have my glasses on. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> the two old people can't read it without their glasses. Okay, this is a certificate of appreciation presented by the Brockton Public Schools to Laurie Tantillo and Lowe's for their generous support of Brockton Public Schools students, Lowe's donation of landscaping materials, appliances, and classroom supports has helped to make East Middle School and Brockton High School more attractive, environmentally conscious, and student-centered environments that meets the needs of all members of the school community. And this is presented to you and co-signed by both uh, the superintendent of schools and myself. Oh, it's my nice. pleasure to present That's that to awesome. you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You're very it was welcome. truly my pleasure. I just, I absolutely enjoyed it. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, let's put you oh, over here in between. Come on. <laughs> it's all right. I know, I know. Yeah. Students have gifts for you, too. Oh, how cool. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep on the uh, thank yous and donations. Uh, I do want to also thank uh, Bernardi. Um, they recently had a juried art show from our Summerfest this past summer. They invited all of the students that were, were winners during the juried art show. Uh, to their establishment. They have Jimbo's Cafe there. They catered the event for the families, the kids, the community. The artwork was shown. All very, very impressive. And again, thank you to Bernardi. On another note, um, I want to do a show and tell here. With everything that is happening, and, and certainly every night we're watching the news about the enterovirus, about many of the things that, that we're concerned to keep our students healthy uh, in the Brockton Public Schools, and uh, I came upon an article that talked about, you know, keeping classrooms safe and cleaning doorknobs and cleaning desktops and, and making sure that we're trying not to spread viruses. And I made a phone call to uh, Kim Haloon, um, again, the uh, chief executive officer, I believe, at, at Signature, uh, Brockton Hospital, Signature Healthcare. And without batting an eyelash, they have ordered cases of these to come to the Brockton Public Schools which we'll distribute in each of our classrooms. And again, that's another thank you to uh, you know, a local, obviously, uh, group that is looking to really support our children. So thank you to Kim Haloon. And um, also tonight, I get to introduce you to our new high school. Uh, this is uh, an alternate to our student representative on the school committee. It is Valerie. Mariquin, Valerie, you are a senior at Brockton High School. I am. So welcome, we're thrilled to have you, and I think you have a report for us. I do. For Brockton High. Okay, so last week we had six former Brockton High students come to the Little Theater here and they did presentations because they're candidates for their PhDs. So they did presentations on their research in science fields, and lots of students were able to come down and actually learn from their research, so we had that last. Also last week, we had PSATs for juniors, so they were able to get the experience of like the SATs last week, and about a thousand students took it, so that's a great experience for them. Um, coming up, we have an in-service day this Thursday, so we have a half day, we get out at 11. Friday, we have a football game. Um, oh, Halloween hallway is coming up, next Wednesday and student council has been preparing for it and along with student council we have other clubs joining us who are going to be doing different things with the kids who come so I know National Honor Society is coming the executive committees have something set up too along with like knitting club book club um, key club they're, they're all participating in that so we're looking forward to that right now and oh, also one thing we're focusing on this year for Halloween Hallway is allergies. So lots of kids who come have allergies to like peanuts. And we're trying to find a way to um, 
kind of distinguish them. So either we're using stickers or bracelets, so we can like use that to make sure that we don't give any Reese's to people who are allergic to peanuts. And um, this is in November, but on the 10th, there is a Veterans Day Assembly, and the band will be performing along with other presentations. That's all. Very good. Um, the Halloween hallway, um, I know, was a huge success last year. Yeah. I want to say we they had, had over I think 500. Yeah, I was going to say students. exactly that. So I'm sure word got out there. It and did. when parents are looking for a, a safe opportunity, and again, hosted by our high school students, and again, it's all of our students. I know our special needs students are busy working on making sure that they're supporting the Halloween hallway. Um, I wasn't able to go last year. I can't wait to see it. Um, so again, a, a great opportunity to support our children. And I know many of you, uh, the Veterans Day Assembly is well attended. Um, it's, it's, I think, the highlight of really, I know we have the Veterans Day Parade, and not to take away from that, but I know many people, including our veterans, look forward to coming and uh, hearing uh, our uh, band uh, and hearing the presentations on our Veterans Day uh, celebration. Okay. And I also want to uh, bring to your attention um, our own Jim Donito uh, is working for Halloween on what they're calling with the Rock Stadium. It's called the Field of Screams. And I know they're presently putting together uh, uh, haunted rocks, catacombs, refreshments, photo ops with monsters, kiddies area for little frights, face painting surprises. And this will be, I believe, Friday, October 17th and Saturday the 18th then Friday the 24th and Saturday the 25th and Sunday the 26th. So I know these are going out to all of the school children in Brockton and uh, Jim again is very excited you know, for the opportunity. Um, I want to also let you know, I know you received this information, but I want to congratulate uh, Adam St. Peter. Adam is going to be our new assistant principal at the Arnon School. Um, those of you that know Adam, he has been a longtime teacher in the Brockton Public Schools at the Angelo School, grade three. Uh, he recently did his administrative internship program and we're going to welcome him uh, as he makes the change to the Arnone School. And before I get into serious business, I know that we've been talking about pedestrian safety and you and I have both been in the schools, we've been talking to students, we're awaiting the billboard to come up, we continue to support our health curriculum which is presently talking to students about those choices. But I had the opportunity to go to the Angelo School to see the curriculum in action and to talk to a number of the students. And I was very impressed. And of course, when you're leaving, I told the kids I wanted them to put together posters. I wanted them to, to share best practices with their peers. And I had to share with you, it was one of those things at the end of the day, you sit back and you look at the, the pile that came from the Angelo students. And I picked out some of the best. One is, I do have to invite at some point Sean Galligan. He's a grade five student at the Angelo. And he put together a song for us called Pedestrian Safety. So I'd love to invite him here and see if he can sing the song for us and share that with our community. But two of my favorites, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, but it's Pedestrian Safety. And this is Emily Ta, also grade five at the Angelo School. And Emily has herself and, and I think a sibling riding in the back seat and mom is turning around. And what Emily says is don't turn around to yell at your kids. Pay attention to the road or pull over. And she doesn't stop at that. <laughs> she shows the kids in the back and she says, kids, don't make your parents yell at you. It's unsafe. Also, if you see your parents go over the speed limit, politely tell them to slow down. <laughs> so I mean, some of these are just priceless. It shows the headphones. And it shows a better way to cross the street, which is paying attention. Um, and again, this one here is uh, Renee Long, grade five. And she shows the student that, again, has the, I think it's earbuds. I'm saying headphones. I think I'm dating myself. But the earbuds, not paying attention to the traffic or the rules of the road. And she shows very clearly you know, what somebody should be doing in crossing the street. So thank you to those Angelo students, as I said. I. I'd love to share all of it with you. It's, uh, it's great when our kids you know, take what we're saying seriously. And I believe the message is getting across that we're, we're concerned about their safety. Um, to get down to some serious business, I shared with you this morning, and, and I want to talk about this briefly, 
But I do want to alert you um, because at the last school committee meeting, I came here very excited. I was excited for a number of reasons. Uh, our district, because of our accountability with achievement and student growth, most notably student growth, uh, a formula that was developed this past year after much thought from our uh, Board of Education in looking at accountability determinations, we had risen above the lowest 10% in the state. And at that time, because of the regulation, there was talk of there had been two Commonwealth Charter School applications. One of them was here in Brockton, uh, the New Heights Charter School, and they were not going to be allowed to go forward with that application in our district. They were going to be allowed to rewrite their application for another district because the rule states or the law, the regulation states, that the uh, first two need to go to a district that is in the lowest 10%. We received uh, communication, I want to say, just about a week ago, late last week, that in fact the uh, charter schools, the two charter schools, had asked for a waiver of that regulation. Uh, I received word that it would not be heard until the November 25th Board of Education meeting in Malden, and in fact that will happen. And I'll be speaking to all our school committee members. Um, I hope you'll be joining me that day because I will be presenting um, our position paper on why we, again, want to make sure that the waiver um, is not approved and the uh, law and regulations as written are upheld. What happened to me yesterday was I was told that the superintendents in both Fitchburg and Brockton, which are the affected communities, would have three minutes today to address the Board of Education. So I did just that today. I would like to share with you what was said. I said, uh, good morning, I'm Kathleen Smith, superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools. I want to thank the board for hearing us this morning. There are many sides to this charter school expansion debate, and we look forward to presenting our arguments when this issue is formally taken up by the board next month. We are not asking you to change any laws or waive any regulations. We believe the current regulations were modified for good reasons, and we support you in those well-considered and thoughtful decisions. Our case will be based on a number of facts that prove that Brockton is not the right place for a charter school. First and foremost, the change in the regulation was made to recognize the importance of student growth in making school and district accountability determinations. It was a much needed revision long sought by urban educators from across the Commonwealth. Both Brockton and Fitchburg demonstrate a high level of student growth proof that urban students can and do achieve at high levels. The spirit of the regulation was to ensure the charter schools were deployed in the communities that needed them most. Brockton and Fitchburg are not among those communities by any of the state's accountability measures. And that is not a technicality, that is the result of hard work and determination. We urge you not to waive the current regulation to minimize the importance of student growth. Finally, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has provided the current charter applicants with the opportunity to reframe their proposals to serve the neediest 10% of districts as defined by the current regulation. If there are to be additional charter schools next year, we should abide by the regulations and locate those charter schools in the communities that demonstrate the greatest need, not in the communities most convenient for the provider. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to this issue. Superintendent Ravenel and I are both very proud of the work our school districts are doing to meet the needs of diverse populations. Brockton has a proud tradition as a gateway city. We understand the needs of newcomers and English language learners. We have some of the most varied and valuable programs for students with special needs. We are leaders in helping traumatized children learn, and we have one of the oldest talented and gifted programs in the region. Our students have every opportunity to learn from pre-K through 12 to our multiple pathways for non-traditional learners. Brockton is dedicated to finding innovative ways to meet the needs of all students, and our track record proves it. We are committed to instructional excellence for every student every day. We are proud of our schools, our teachers, and students, and we welcome any of you to visit Brockton any time in the next month. I'd be happy to tour you through any school or any program so that you can see firsthand why we are the city of champions. I want to thank my leadership team for sitting down yesterday 
and thinking exactly again about our response. I think it was the correct response at this time. Um, I'm hoping that on Saturday, I know we have our facility uh, review planned. And at that point, I would like to also address, we have a number of elected officials that will attend, our city councilors, uh, some of our legislators will be there. Um, and, and I do want to speak to them about this. Um, th this is not um, a fight that, that we want to take on in, in fighting a charter school. That's not where we're at. We are at a point right now where we want these regulations upheld and we firmly believe that the Brockton community does not have a need for charter schools. And the one thing that I will share with you is when I did my listening tour last year, and many of you know that it started from the time I was elected in listening to community groups, in listening to parents, in listening to students, there was talk about a lot of things that we can do better or things in the Brockton Public Schools that parents wanted to see. There were hours upon hours. There was an entry plan that was presented to you last May 3rd. At not one point did somebody talk to me about needing an additional choice for parents in our communities. And I want to say again, not just as superintendent in other roles that I've had and those of you that have known me, is we have always been out there. If there's something innovative, right now we're looking at Horace Mann, you know, um, grants for Horace Mann Charter. We're looking at innovation for some of the additional things we'd like to do in our district. So I think we continue to do that. Um, again, as, as we start to position ourselves as to how we move forward for the 25th, we will be developing a position paper, and I will share that with you uh, as we go forward. I'm sorry, Mrs. Joyce. If I may, uh, after battling two charter school applications over the past several years, one thing has become um, crystal clear is that Brockton's community is not looking for a charter school. Parents aren't looking for another choice. We have abundant choices within our own school district. And another thing that we have learned is that the charter schools, the for-profit charter schools that have come to present are coming here based upon opportunity. And, and you made that abundantly clear in your letter and your presentation, and not based on need. It's not what they see that Brockton needs. It's their, opportunity, it's their opportunity to put a charter school in a city. Um, not to make it better, but to give them an opportunity. Um, and I hope that the DESC sees that. Sees it as an opportunity for charter schools, but not an opportunity for the community. And I think that's, that's very important uh, going forward um, as they make their decision. One of the things that was also, uh, actually it, it seems to not be talked about, and I think we have to be very clear here. Um, you know, we're, we're facing, and I keep saying tough budget times, but, but it's tough economic times for, for all of us. Um, it's tough economic times as we try to, we know what to do for our students, and we know how to do it well. But as we look for every dollar to make sure that we're able to position our kids to be competitive, the last thing that we want, and the truth of charter, is they do drain funds from districts just like ours, urban districts. So that is something that is very, very real to us. Um, that is not my first point. Again, I, I think our point is that, that we are an urban cen center that kind of defies all odds. You know, we are the only urban district that remains level three. We have a number of level two schools. We have an award-winning high school. We have multiple pathways. Everybody has an opportunity in our community. We welcome collaborations in our community. Uh, we sat there this week with uh, Trinity Catholic, a number of the private schools, talking about the things for all of our students, school safety, the Ebola crisis happening. We welcome that kind of, we're inclusive. You know, we understand that they're all our children, and people make choices. But again, this is one of those times that the right thing happened for urban districts. It is truly a measure of student growth, and you are doing that well. So uh, um, again, we will go back and strategically we will start to plan our paper uh, for the 25th. Still you. Any other questions? Um, and I talked about, again, the uh, facility tour uh, that will, actually it's our facility review that will take place on Saturday morning, October 20, uh, 25th, I'm sorry, Saturday. We're going to meet here uh, in the little theater. We have a short PowerPoint. Uh, what we plan to do with the PowerPoint is show some of 
the remodeling that has gone on at a number of our sites, the Kennedy School, the Barrett Russell, and we have a tour planned to uh, take people throughout the school to show some of the needs that we have. We already have our subcommittee forming, as we talked about, looking at, again, the buildings, uh, looking at possibly reconfiguration as we prepare you know, for our facility master plan. So we will have a networking uh, breakfast in the morning, and uh, I anticipate we'll probably be busy right through noontime. So I know many of you have responded. Um, we thank uh, BAT, who is partnering with us on this. One of the things that Ray Ledoux and I talked about, and again, they're always ready to collaborate with us, and there will also be some slides, again, on uh, our student safety, pedestrian safety, and that'll be uh, our collaboration for putting together uh, this facility review. And that's it. That is for learning and teaching. The only other thing I do want to mention is at the uh, last subcommittee meeting, and I know we're going to be looking at some dates for subcommittee meetings, we talked about our finance subcommittee meeting, and we're going to be looking to set that date. But what we also did do is we went back and looked at, after October 1st, I told you I would be looking at uh, personnel. We would be looking at programs, which is what you directed us to go back and look at. So hopefully we'll be able to set that meeting up for early November, and we'll be able to talk about some of the funds we have available. We can prioritize as a group some of the things. We've got some options as far as bringing back you know, some programs. Uh, granted, they're modified right now with our budget, but we will have some opportunities to take a look um, at the budget. One of the dates we were suggesting, um, is it possible to do it before the school committee meeting on November 5th, which is a Wednesday, not a Tuesday because of the election? For an hour? Would you say, I'd say six o'clock to seven, does that work? Okay. Six o'clock on November 5th prior to the regular school committee meeting. I'm going to, I'm just going to come yeah, back the, up. Uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's probably an hour coming back from there. Uh, so that's going to be very tight for, because you're Tuesday. down and okay. I think Tom is near too, so. Try to keep Tuesdays open. So the following Tuesday is November, oh, that's the holiday? Is that the holiday? Oh, is it? Yeah. I thought it was on Monday. Would you like me to have one to get back to the group? Yeah. yeah All right, please. so we'll take a look at some other dates beside the fifth. Okay. I'm all set. All right. Okay. How about uh, items to refer to? I'm sorry, Mr. Minichello. We received a uh, informational um, with respect to Ebola. Did you want to talk a little bit about that, or? Are you uh, sure. Nurse supervisor working with the Brockton uh, Fire Department. Yes, um, I want to thank the, the Fire Department, the Mayor's Office, the Board of Health. Um, there was a meeting called together last week by the, um, the Mayor and the um, Police Chief, uh, Chief Francis, um, that called all the stakeholders together. Uh, it was a great meeting. We were on the phone with a, an official from the CDC from Dallas, obviously um, right on the front lines of, of, of fighting this. Um, as a follow-up to that meeting, uh, Mayor Carpenter is going to have weekly meetings in his office every Friday, uh, so all the stakeholders stay updated on the most recent information, um, so obviously to keep everybody safe. As far as the schools go today, um, uh, uh, Superintendent Smith was um, gracious enough to put the money aside to bring all the nurses together uh, on a non-meeting day. Um, Deputy Chief Galligan and his team and a, and a uh, representative from AMR came in today and trained all our nurses about response and how to, number one, screen either staff or um, children that come into the nurse's office with a fever, what questions to ask to screen them, and then if it needs to be taken to the next level, obviously you would get the fire department involved and also the Board of Health. So that was the first step today with our nurses. The goal is for us to develop a one-page document that all schools follow as far to, as how to respond if we um, suspect somebody comes in with um, 
that might, might have uh, the disease. Um, but you also be, have to be very careful that you can't cause mass panic, obviously in a school, because that, if you do, um, and, it, and obviously for no reason, then you know, there are other safety issues that can happen where people can get hurt if, you know, if there's panic and people don't deal with things the right way. Uh, the fire department um, was clear about what happened in Braintree um, about two weeks ago, and it was kind of chaos there. So the main goal of, of the, the nurses coming together today with the, the officials from the fire department and AMR was to get everybody on the same page. We will follow that up tomorrow. It actually, the timing worked out perfectly. All our principals are meeting with the superintendent tomorrow at, at, uh, in the afternoon. The first um, part of that meeting will be um, the nurse and supervisor, Tobias Cowens, the uh, emergency director, and also the members, Deputy Chief Galligan and, and his team, to then talk with the principals about what they went over with the nurses and what our steps are and procedures are that are in place. So after tomorrow, every school will have a one-page document of the steps that they should follow. And then every Friday um, with Mayor Carpenter and his team, we will be getting updates. And if we have to change uh, practices and procedures, then we will do that as, as we get updated through those meetings on Friday. So um, as Deputy Chief Galligan told us today that uh, he's getting several calls from other communities that are nowhere close to being as prepared as we are, uh, as far uh, as far as, as as ahead of we are to um, to most communities. Uh, we also invited um, to these meetings yesterday and the one tomorrow. I invited uh, Cardinal Spellman. Trinity Catholic and also the Seventh Day Adventist. Those are schools that we service with transportation. Um, their administrative staff and nursing staff uh, were also invited to attend these meetings with us. So, you know, just so everybody's on the same page, so we can entertain any questions. I'm sure Mayor Carpenter has been in the thick of it as well. Can can jump in. We're extremely prepared. It's something that's uh, looked at on a daily basis, uh, as Mike said. Uh, we had a great meeting uh, last week, getting everyone in the, in the room together. It was, it was impressive. I, I think that we're probably far ahead of most communities in terms of being prepared. Uh, AMR has an ambulance that meets the CDC requirements it's on standby in the city of Brockton in the event that we ever do have to respond to someone that's at high risk. Uh, all of our first responders are equipped with the proper equipment. Um, we are getting updates from DPH almost daily. We're checking in with CDC twice a day. Um, AMR has been outstanding. Uh, so, I mean, everyone, um, Steve Hook in terms of a Brockton Emergency Management has been coordinating a lot of the, the communications. So, um, I think the keys are that we are adopting the protocols uh, in terms of the first responders. I think one of our biggest concerns is that we not have any overreaction because the flu season is coming. It's flu symptoms. We have 17,500 students. We're going to have thousands of students who have flu symptoms this year. Um, so it's going to be really important that we not overreact. Um, all the basic precautions we take for flu, for flu just become even more important this year. It's going to be really important that if a child's running a fever, you keep him or her home. Don't send them to school until they're 24 hours past having a fever. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, you know, really important to get as many people having their flu shots as possible, particularly senior citizens and young children. Um, so those, those regular flu um, cautions just become even more important this year because the more we can reduce the number of flu cases, that's that many less that we have to be watching to see if there's any signs for someone at high risk. There's no, one to, no way to know at the point that someone's presenting symptoms whether they have Ebola or not. So the classification, the, the triage that's done is, uh, is to triage the person to determine if they go from low risk to high risk. And if they go from low risk to high risk, that's when all the safety precautions uh, kick in. And it's going to be essentially make sure people have the right safety equipment on, isolate the patient, get them into the specially equipped ambulance, get them over to the hospital. We're very lucky that we have two hospitals here in the city. Um, AMR, our ambulance company, has already been drilling with both hospitals. 
so they're practicing already in the event that they may have to transport a high-risk patient. Um, so I, I think people should feel comfortable that um, all precautions are being taken with staying current, and as Mike said, all of the uh, key city agencies and first responders will be meeting in my office once a week to go over updates just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, everyone has the latest information. CDC has been changing some protocols already just as we go along. So, I mean, this thing is somewhat of a moving target, and that's why the communication piece is going to be so important because uh, they have made several changes in protocols already. So we have the resources. I think we're as prepared as we can possibly be. And I think our biggest message is going to be that a lot of folks are going to have flu symptoms. We don't want to overreact. Um, and even in terms of the fire department and the nurses, we're doing the same screening. The dispatchers now, if they're called out to someone that's you know presenting severe flu symptoms, um, the dispatchers will actually be asking questions on the phone before the first responders even get there to, to hit the questions, um, sustained high fever, someone in the immediate family been out of the country in the last 30 days, that type of stuff. So there'll be the dispatcher on the phone will be able to let the first responders know what they're walking into before they even get there. Um, so we're ready. And I think people should be confident that we're ready in the event that we do have to deal uh, with an Ebola case. But, you know, it's far more likely that we'll have thousands of cases of good old-fashioned flu. <coughs> now we get questions. <laughs> we'll work our way around. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Uh, do, we, uh, do we update on an annual basis? And if we haven't, I think we need to the notifications to the parents in that all the children have up-to-date uh, good notifications because they may have something a year or two old people have changed or situations have changed to make sure they have the latest number or numbers and the proper number of backups in case somebody's not available. We're talking about emergency, emergency phone numbers. numbers, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I know we get new numbers at the beginning of the year from every student, right? We do. I they update them. I know as good practice, I think they do it halfway through the year. Right, but not updated halfway through the year. We ask parents if there is any change to let us know. Um, we can make sure we get a message out to them, letting, you know, letting them know that if there's any change in their emergency numbers, make sure they're communicating that with our schools. Mrs. Joyce? Uh, I think your, your point about not overreacting and that we are going to have you know, children coming into to, to school ill with flu-like symptoms is going to happen and not to panic over it. But in the unlikely event that someone is designated as high risk, they had a relative that came over from a high risk area, is there a mechanism in place for the emergency services or the fire department or the hospital, if there are children in that family that attend public schools, to notify administration that that, that has occurred? Um, is that outside, is that, is that protected by HIPAA or given the um, or privacy laws? So, so the, question, know, the question is if, if they ever identified say a if person a, with a, Ebola a would be in the A parent comes back home. from a high risk area, has, a, has yep. those symptoms, and is in, in the home and those children go to Brockton Public Schools. Is there anything in a mechanism in place to inform that it's in the household, possibly, you know, let's keep an eye on these kids? I'm not saying keep um, them out of school by any means. To that specific, I don't know if they answer, but there is a protocol in place to identify anyone who's been in contact with the person within the past 21 days. So, um, that would obviously include family members in, in school, but they would actually, they, they take a step even much more that they're going to immediately attempt to identify anyone that's been in close personal contact with the person that's presenting symptoms. And on our DPH call, DPH is working on uh, getting a, uh, it's close to being ready, a facility in Jamaica Plain that will be able to test for Ebola and get results in four hours. So what will happen is if once if that patient's at the hospital and they're determining high risk, 
then that special ambulance will transport them to Jamaica Plain so that we can get a test and get a result within four hours so we know yeah. whether we're actually yeah, that, dealing with the true Ebola really case big, or not. Yeah. And, and in the end, I think these protocols that you're putting in place are just best practice anyway. You know, if you, your, your child has a fever, don't send them to school. If you, as an adult, and work in the school system, you have a fever, don't go to work. Stay home, take care of yourself. There are a lot of communicable diseases and viruses that you know, are pretty lousy for people to get you know, because you show up at work or school sick. ill. So if you're sick, stay home. Right, and that's, that stuff is gonna become even more important. That was some of the conversation we had in terms of the schools was the um, nurses and teachers being really diligent about a child's got symptoms contacting the family and, and telling them to keep the child home until they're symptom free for 24 hours. Nobody wants the flu either. Right, right. We sent a message earlier. I know you're all aware of that. Um, I know we had talked about sending out another message to parents and we'll keep them informed as best we can, talk about the best practices or talk about how they can collaborate with us to keep everybody healthy. Yeah, I think it's even more critical now so people don't overreact. Mm -hmm. Mr. Minicello. See that the city and uh, the health department and your office is taking this obviously seriously. Um, correctly pointed out, you know, uh, a point of vulnerability is definitely people coming from or spending time in some of the places that have been affected by this, and then coming into our community, as happened in Dallas. Um, but another point of vulnerability is obviously our um, uh, parent uh, parent information center. So uh, what I would suggest is that you know that office, if not already, be provided with you know a list of locales, locations, countries where this is prevalent, so that if in fact a student is coming in from abroad, registering or trying to register from one of these points of origin, um, that we consult before we bring that student into one of our classrooms with the health department and local officials um, and be, you know, prudent before allowing entry uh, for the, you know, I'd rather be cautious than foolish. We met with the Parent Information Center about a month ago now? Yeah, about, yeah, about three weeks to four weeks ago. And, uh, they were also present today at the meeting, um, but also if any anybody um, does show up from uh, one of the countries that is listed as high risk. Um, we also, um, with the help of the mayor's office and the Board of Health, um, the Neighborhood Health Center will screen them and they need to get clearance from the Neighborhood right. Health Center. That needs to go through the Board of Health and then it goes through Parent Information Center before they can even be registered for school. Perfect. So that's been in place for about three weeks. Excellent. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Jordan. One, public health as an office can override certain laws. It has the law to do that. It hasn't had to do it in many, many years, but in the past, they have the ability to override the rights of individuals' personal health information for the better good of, of the community, uh, where in the past they had to quarantine and other kinds of things. So those laws are still on the books, and some of the news media is saying things that are incorrect when it comes to that. The other piece is, I think we as a world are concentrating too much on, and I'll say Africa uh, as a whole, where two of the individuals picked it up here, other people were on planes, et cetera, so far that's turned out negative, but it could be anywhere that you could get this. So, and you don't know until after the fact that you were exposed. So our, I guess, lead that we're trying to take to say from certain countries or certain airlines on to do this or that doesn't make a lot of sense because a lot of people don't know the culture in some of these areas is not to come directly to this country it's going to go to another country in Europe because it's cheaper to take the short run and then get on a cheaper run from there here not necessarily uh, recording that you came directly from this one of these countries so it's that kind of thing that we're doing that um, to me, it doesn't make sense. I think you have to just make across the board when these situations come up to do the, the screening, et cetera. 
uh, even the president, I think, recognized that when originally it was saying five airports and what have you, they'd like everybody to go through a certain airport. What do you do if you're taking a boat across? Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways to come to this country besides fly. So there's, there's a lot of weaknesses in the ability to try to detect what's what. And I think common sense also has to come into this. But our, our public health department needs to be right up on 100% on what's going on and review their own laws on what capabilities they have to do in these situations. So. Yeah, I, I believe the, uh, the screening question that we're currently using is if any member of the household has been out of the country in the last 30 days. It it's, doesn't specify a country, just any member of the household has been out of the country. That's one of the criteria that could elevate you to a high risk you know, classification. Are we good? Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Okay, we'll move on to unfinished business and uh, ask the uh, superintendent for a curriculum update uh, from a recent subcommittee meeting. Uh, the school committee uh, had charged the superintendent with, um, I guess, uh, What's the word I want to use? Researching, coming up with a, a way to incorporate the uh, great curriculum into our middle schools and also f a fifth grade program. So I know, Superintendent, you've been doing a lot of work in that area, so we have, we're eager um, to hear. We, we met this past week, uh, myself, Lieutenant Mills, uh, Mary Ellen Corain, um, I believe um, Dr. Murray from our middle schools, a number of us met to talk about Liz Barry, our deputy superintendent. We met to talk about how we could incorporate the great curriculum. I told you that I would have a, a schedule for you. I'm going to invite Mary Ellen to come down. Um, so on, on a couple of notes, starting with our elementary schools. And again, a lot of this is about capacity. It isn't just about our SRO officers. We also have our school police that are very pleased that in the past year they have been trained and are looking for opportunities to also get into our classrooms and to teach the great curriculum. So we have at the Huntington School, uh, I'm going to call it a pilot school, for our uh, great curriculum for our fifth graders. And as you know, we talked about six lessons uh, for our fifth graders, our elementary students. And that is happening right now. Two of our school police officers, Officer Hancock uh, and Officer Kevin Smith, are team teaching there. So this is their first time out of the box with getting into a classroom and actually delivering curriculum. Um, I was surprised, but um, Mrs. Saber McGuire told me they were a little nervous, but they invited me right away to come and to see what's happening. So I'm looking forward to doing that and also expanding that to other elementary schools, and that is six full lessons. What we're doing for our middle schools, and the mayor and I talked at length about this today, um, and I've talked again uh, with Mary Ellen, and we have come up with, actually she worked very hard uh, with our team to come up with a plan looking at this year and making sure that every one of our seventh grade is across the district and we're starting a little bit late we're already almost into november but we're going to make sure when we looked at our curriculum versus the great curriculum there were a number of goals that we don't actually touch upon and we decided this year we would take a look at those objectives it would be 90 minutes worth of class time not the full 13 lessons for this year but we would affect every one of our seventh graders so I have a, a calendar here that I'm willing to share with you this evening um, our schools are a little bit different the K to 8s have a different time than uh, north south east and west so there are some different scenarios at different schools but what I will tell you is they will get 90 minutes of great training this year now the good news for next year is what we would like to do is starting next year we would take our sixth graders and during their time in being in middle school sixth seventh and eighth grade we would make sure that they would have all 13 lessons so our sixth grade next year would, would start with four lessons when they become seventh grade is an additional four a continuation and in their eighth grade they'll finish up with their last five lessons so they will be certified if that's the right word or graduate i think it is from the great program 
so we'll stop that next year. We're a little bit concerned about capacity, but that gives us time to look at schedules to see if we have enough school resource officers, school police, do we need to train additional people? And we're, we're excited to have them in our health classes working with our teachers. So Mary Ellen is here if you have any questions about our plan for this year or any comments on how we'll begin to implement and our plan for next year going forward. Well, I would just like to say that I'm uh, very excited to see that you know we have a plan to, to implement this into our middle school curriculum. I think when we saw the, for lack of a better word, traditional great curriculum, it's usually the 13 lessons in two years, seventh and eighth grade, but where we have the middle school model, it gives us the chance to spread those 13 lessons over three years gets us talking to those sixth graders. Uh, it also makes it less of a demand, less intrusive in the regular curriculum each year because it's uh, spreading it out over three years instead of two. I think this idea of bringing it in at sixth grade next school year, and then we'll, we'll be essentially phasing it in over three years. So as that sixth grade class goes to seventh grade, we'll have two years of curriculum, and then when that sixth grade class gets to the eighth grade, we'll now have all three years fully in the great program. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I think this is really important uh, for all the reasons we discussed before in terms of uh, trying to help prepare our kids to make better decisions. I, and I also love the aspect of getting um, police officers in the schools, in the classrooms, developing relationships with kids on a favorable basis. And I think that alone uh, is a huge benefit of the program. Mr. Minicello. I can't agree more. I just think that the more um, exposure to these types of prevention programs, I don't think there's any downside in it. Um, you know, we're constantly, every day in the news, hearing about, you know, bad things um, happening to young people everywhere in, in all communities. But the more I think that we can do um, and weave it into our curriculum, uh, at whatever point we can, um, you know, if if it helps, if it helps one or two kids, I mean, and we can do it, we do it. You know, um, there's just no downside to it. It's just a matter of the feasibility, fitting it in. Where do we fit it in? How can we weave it in with the schedule? But um, I'm glad to see the cooperation between, you know, sort of law enforcement, city side, and school side, and I just you know, can't emphasize enough, you know, the more exposure, the better. Um, in essence, for lack of a pilot program with a couple lessons in the seventh grade this year, I guess it's giving us a chance to dip our toes in the pool a little bit and, and begin to implement it, and then allowing some time over the spring and summer to really figure out how in the sixth grade next year we bring those four lessons into the sixth grade next year. And then as that group goes up over the next two years, we'll be adding a year of curriculum each year. And at one point when you have all three, you will have affected 3,600 youngsters at one time if we're able to build that capacity. Um, Mary Ellen is here if you want to ask about the 90 minutes. And we took a look at our curriculum and what is offered. And what we pulled out were those pieces that weren't. And that's what we were trying to to uh, affect in the 90 minutes. Mr. Jordan. You said one out of the box thing. Idea, is it possible to use any of our seniors to maybe be inclusive with those offices to be part of that and that their peer groupings in a way with, they're working with the offices, but they also are, are doing, I don't wanna say teaching, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but something with the youngsters where it's coming from them, it may be a little more acceptive to, to some extent. I think Since you're the, running a pilot, think, that might be an idea. Well, I think one of the things we've been talking about today is getting more officers certified to, to be able to teach the program. Um, so we'll be having, uh, with through Lieutenant Mills, but we'll be speaking with the chief um, we do have a couple of community outreach officers. Um, we, we've got a, you know, we've got several officers that may be a good fit that would kind of fit into their overall mission. Um, so I, I think that's the immediate area we're looking is getting more officers certified, and that's what's going to give us a chance to kind of identify exactly how many instructors we need for how many hours per week to get 
four lessons taught through eight schools times 1,200 kids next year. Um, but we'll have plenty of time to plan for it. Or if not that, we're even a, a role playing of some kind where the children themselves could do that. Not so much the grades, but again, the older kids do it. Because then you're, you're mixing it in, plus it's reinforcing with them before they leave us. Uh, maybe look in law enforcement, maybe into teaching, so. Sure, I'm sure they're willing to look at everything. Mrs. Joyce. Hi, joining us. Uh, the 90 minutes of class time for the seventh graders for this year, mm -hmm. is that being conducted by the school police officers? Yes. Okay. yes. The, the officers, what we've done is we've carved out, um, and you can see that the schedules are different in each school. So we've, we we've carved out 90 minutes of instruction that will be done during the health class this year. And so there will be conversation by my staff before the officer comes. And just for the record, they're all not strangers because they work together all the time. Um, my, the health teachers at the middle school um, access the officers right now in the, when they teach the drug unit. Um, as we uh, talked about it at school committee, at the subcommittee meeting, um, we're actually trying to continue to increase our community collaborations. We have the fire department coming in for the younger kids. We have UMass Extension. And with all of those collaborations, it takes a bit of time to figure out um, who's on first, what's on second. And I don't know is on third. I think I was told earlier this week. Um, I forgot that one. <laughs> and. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at trying to see if we can really cement, as, as Superintendent Smith said, the, the two uh, solid minutes. These are, these are new lessons. They're not the ones from years back. These are new officers. So it, it can be their first time in front of a class. So they'll be doing this with the health teachers who know the students. And as I said, there'll be pre discussions and post discussions and then we'll come back to the table and see how can we enhance that this whole schedule by the way will also flip again in the spring because of the way the semesters are and again the goal being that all seventh graders will receive these core concepts um, are obviously them the health teachers speak about them but not to the expertise as the officers and through the great program training they were learned how to facilitate better conversations and possibly role plays and ongoing discussion so it's not going to be a you know kind of two lessons and no discussion afterwards there'll be before and after and then we'll look at other components and other times of the day there um, that go on in the middle school um, because we have as we showed you at, at the meeting a very rich uh, curriculum there's enrichment times there's uh, elective blocks and that also might come play into this factoring next year because that takes pressure of the officer um, as you can see the schedule that one of, one of the teachers might have seventh grade at eight in the morning and then not one until two in the afternoon and, and that that's hard because you know that what do we do in between yeah. and we don't necessarily want the officer racing back and forth to schools either um, we want a a, a solid partnership and, a, and communication and the officer to be able to be seen in the school so um, I think this is a great pilot it's how we've started all our other partnerships as I said with UMass Extension the walk safe program actually was a partnership with AAA and look at how far that went and the success that we've had so we welcome it we look forward to it um, we're kind of used to it um, the teachers are very flexible and we want to make it work for the students That's great. Now, the fifth grade pilot program of six lessons at the Huntington, mm -hmm. uh, when will that take place during the day? Well, I'm going to be meeting with uh, Liz Barry <laughs> and with June. And we had some, again, some creative ideas. There are there are health classes every half an, every, for a half an hour every week. The fifth grade students um, receive health education. That's 11 schools. Um, there's times when, um, so that would mean every individual fifth grade class would receive a lesson um, unless we assign an officer a week, and that's some Only strategic at the work. Though, correct? Sorry? Only right now. Only for right now, but if okay. we share that with some of the other schools, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and look at teacher schedules, availability of the police officers. Again, the priority being the grade at the seven, right. and then we'll start looking at um, doing that. There are key component times during the day where um, 
again, there's enrichment activities, there's uh, common planning time where you might be able to take two fifth grade classes and put them together. Again, ensuring that all the students get the program. So that's what we're going to start looking at um, in the next month as to what would that look like in the elementary beyond the Huntington School. I think uh, but that's for this year. That's for this year, yes, right. We have the pilot right now at the Huntington I with our that. two school right. police officers. Yeah. I'm hoping this year to look for other opportunities to yeah. expand it in the okay. district right. for six months. Next lessons. year you mentioned that we have a more comprehensive six to eight program. Do we have anything in mind for fifth graders for next year at this point? If we had the capacity, I would like right. to see those six lessons in our fifth grade also. Okay, so We're that's still a work capacity. in progress right now. Correct. Okay, right. I, I get that. It's okay. the number of schools and the way the, the classes are, are scheduled. Um, as I said, the hardest part will be having the officers free to be able to be there um, and, and consistently be there and cover a whole school because sometimes a teacher might again start with a second grade then have a fourth grade then have a fifth then have a third and then have a fifth so if we that's what we want to sit down with with June and with Liz and look and see are there common times when we might be able to pull together two fifth grade classes or and and articulate or facilitate the classes at that time well, I think um, you're off to a great start and I appreciate you sharing this with us good thank you Mr. Robinson, um, is there any evaluation component to this curriculum? It's an is it an it's an evidence-based program. My understanding is that um, there used to be like a, a like a pre-post or a pre and post. Um, we, we will be looking at the workbooks. Uh, Lieutenant Mill said, and, and it hasn't been decided exactly how to utilize that resource. Um, some early conversations are looking at um, the, the workbook and using it during the lessons where the grade officer is teaching them, but then leave that behind with the health teacher to use because, again, those other lessons are areas that they're covering anyway, using them as, as um, activities in class and looking at them. We are going to, we do um, assessments at the end of all units, so it's very likely that the teachers could create questions from the great um, lessons, because again, they'll be there, um, to include those in, in the unit. And, and so it would be our assessment, I guess. There's not Yeah, so there's not any great, like the great program content specific, like. Not to my knowledge. I didn't uh, attend the trainings, and um, I think that's a, a good question for Lieutenant Mills. Um, it used to be an essay uh, when the program once came, and students wrote essays, and that was sort of their ticket to leave. Um, but again, that 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 was the the, the assessment piece. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think it, the content is obviously very valuable for right. our students, but if we're carving out space in the regular classroom day, I'd like to know that whatever content we deliver, whoever delivers it, it's being done in some kind of effective way, right. not just that it's being done. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, just something maybe to think about through this pilot year, mm -hmm. um, how we might be able to measure some of those things. Well, I know um, when we, when the UMass folks come in and they do the nutrition, um, if the health teacher does a unit exam, because they're not the only ones who do the nutrition unit, they would incorporate questions from what those students experience with those guest lecturers. So um, I'm thinking that that would probably occur as well, and, and that's something that this schedule being so new hasn't even been given to the health teachers. So at my next department meeting we'll go over this and that's a, good, a, a suggestion will be to incorporate some of those some of those factual information and conversations that were had during the lessons into their unit assessment um, it's yeah. not always a multiple choice test sometimes it's um, you know it's role plays it's it's you know posters it's PSAs so that certainly can be an assessment of what built into what they're going to be doing in this whole violence unit Again, it's part of a bigger picture. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to even, you know, Mayor Carpenter brought it up, that the idea that the police are in the schools and they're the ones mm -hmm. teaching this. I'd love to see if there's some way if we can understand or, or gain knowledge around their, the nature of their relationship with police officers mm -hmm. before and after this. You know, you're, you're talking about kids having a whole other pathway to engage with whether it's a school resource officer or a school police officer, mm -hmm. and, and I imagine part of the impact of the program is that they come out of this not just with a 
content knowledge, but a, a different, a potentially a different view of right. police and, sure. and the role of police in their community mm -hmm. um, and police as a resource versus, you know, however they may or may not have seen them prior to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think there's, there's a lot of different types of information we mm -hmm. can capture that might carry some value. It'd just be interesting to, to think about in this first year as we pilot whether or not, mm -hmm. you know, in future years or moving forward we might be able to find a way to capture that effectively. Mm -hmm. Maybe I love the way you analyze it to death. <laughs> it's four health classes. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about space out of classroom, right? And I think we want to make sure that it's yeah. used. They're, no. they're, not, they're not missing calculus. They're, you know, it's, it's four health classes. Oh, but that's very valuable time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we might not be in the MCAS, but we assess. And, and I think it's, I think because it's topics that we are getting such expertise on from the officers through these lessons, I would like to know, and I think the teachers will like to know, did they capture that, that what the officer was saying? Because that's valuable time on their parts. And I'm, I'm really feeling that they're going to be running all over the city trying to, to meet this goal. Yeah. Um, so I, I would really encourage my staff to include some questions of what the students heard um, while the officers are there. And then we can build on that yeah. um, as to see what else, uh, what else do they want to know about. A good question might be, what else would you like to hear the officers speak on? Because yeah. I know they do it for the drug units. If the officers come in and they speak, they definitely refer back to those presentations. So we, we value that time with them and and so I think know. about building capacity too. Right. That information might benefit the writing of a grant that mm -hmm. we can use sure. to bring in more officers or pay for more officer time or expand the curriculum over time. I mean I, I just think there's a lot of ways it can be used to inform us and to sure. bring in or, or seek out additional resources to support mm -hmm. the program. If it's working we should max it out. Right. Sure. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, as you can see, we've traded the superintendent for Deputy Superintendent Thomas now. A big downgrade. Yeah. <laughs> there better be some cash thrown in the deal. <laughs> um, new business. Mr. Minichello. Five questions I want to ask the superintendent about <laughs> yeah, yeah. Her, her entry plan. Mike, are you prepared <laughs> yeah. to uh, go <laughs> forward with that? My um, staff will be back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, all right. So, first question. Yeah. Uh, one, one quick, one quick note. Um, <laughs> Leo McNeil, who a lot of people know um, right. with respect to Brockton, uh, I should Brockton Credit Union, Holy Mackerel, Harbor One, Harbor One Bank, is going to be retiring, uh, I believe, next week. And he has been a basically good partner to the school system, um, and so is Harbor One. But uh, he participates every year in the Credit for Life program over at Massasoit that I think is very beneficial to our kids. Um, he is always helping out with respect to fundraisers and causes that um, benefit our students at all levels in the Brockton Public Schools. So I would just like to, on behalf of the Brockton Public Schools, wish Leo um, and his wife well because now she will be seeing Leo much more often. Um, but uh, he's just a, a good partner and has always been a good friend of Brockton and the Brockton Public Schools, so I, I wish him well. Absolutely, Leo has been, he's really been the face of Harbor One in the community for a long time, and, and uh, we're all happy for him to retire, but uh, there'll be big shoes for someone else to try to fill. We're gonna wish Leo the best. Under new business, does anyone else have any more new business? Mr. Henningsen. I just wanted to publicly thank the mayor for um, attending the uh, high school event we had with the Brockton High cheerleaders on the 12th. It, oh, was, yeah. uh, it was very well attended. The cheerleaders raised over $1,600 um, through various raffles and meat raffles and etc. So my daughter was excited. She even won an expired gift certificate. So yeah. um, she's thrilled. She's already spent the money and then some. Um, but I just wanted to publicly thank the mayor sure. for, well, for thank attending. Thank you. A lot of good people. Eric and Stacy Wright uh, did a lot of work on that. The cheerleaders themselves and uh, we should probably also rec recognize the Enterprise Club that hosted yes. it, and many of their members worked as volunteers that day. 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had a good time, yeah. and uh, cheerleaders entertained a few things, a few times, and it was, it was a great event, and say we raised over $1,600 for the cheerleaders. Um, I, I'll just mention quickly to folks that uh, this Friday night at the football game, New Bedford? Yes. New Bedford. Uh, at halftime, we'll be dedicating the press box uh, in the name of Pete Farley, the longtime Enterprise Sports Editor. This committee uh, made that decision a little bit earlier in the year, and uh, so we hope that folks at the game will uh, be sure to take note of that, and uh, if you can make the game Friday night, it should, uh, should be a real nice event. Uh, we'll have the marching band as usual at halftime, but there'll also be uh, a brief ceremony up in the press box to dedicate the press box during halftime Friday night, and uh, Again, I thank the members of the school committee for their support in the naming of the press box. Anyone else have anything? Then I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.